Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Don't forget to click like and subscribe if you want more daily updates on audiobook. The White Boy Shuffle by Paul Beatty Prologue On one hand this messiah gig is a bitch. On the other I've managed to fill the perennial void in African American leadership. There is no longer a need for fed-up second-class citizens to place a want ad in the Sunday Classifieds reading, Negro Demagogue. Must have ability to lead a divided, downtrodden, and alienated people to the promised land. Good communication skills required. Pay commensurate with ability. No experience necessary. Being a poet, and thus expert in the ways of soulful coercion, I am eminently qualified. My book, Watermelonin, has sold 126 million copies. I have the ear of the academics, the street denizens, and the political cabalists. Leader of the black community? There is no better job fit. I didn't interview for the job. I was drafted by 22 million hitherto unaffiliated souls into serving as full-time Svengali and foster parent to an abandoned people. I spoon-feed them gruelled futility, unveil the oblivion that is black America's existence and the hopelessness of the struggle. In return I receive fanatical avian obedience. Wherever I travel, a long queue of baby black goslings files behind a plastic wind-up barred spring-driven toward self-destruction, crossing the information superhighway and refusing to look both ways. If, if a movie mogul buys the film rights to my life, the TV Guide synopsis will read, in the struggle for freedom, a reluctant young poet convinces black Americans to give up hope and kill themselves in a climactic crash and burn finale. Full of laughs and high jinks. Some violence and adult language. In the quest for equality, black folks have tried everything. We've begged, revolted, entertained, intermarried, and are still treated like shit. Nothing works, so why suffer the slow deaths of toxic addiction and the American work ethic when the immediate gratification of suicide awaits? In glorious defiance of the survival instinct, Negroes stream into Hillside, California, like lemmings. Every day they wishfully look heavenward, peering into the California smog for a metallic gray atomic dot that will gradually expand until it explodes some 1,000 feet over our natural and processed heads. It will be the emancipation disintegration. Lunch counters, bus seats, and executive washrooms be damned, our mass suicide will be the ultimate sit-in. They're all here, the black American iconographic array, making final preparations for Elysium approximately 500 years after our arrival in this purgatory. The well-dressed guy who worked in the corporate mailroom and malapropped his way through your patronizing efforts to engage him in small talk wonders if he left the stove on, then laughs aloud at the absurdity of it all. The innocuous democratic ex-mayor of your city writes mediocre elegiac verse without a nod to the absurdity of it all. That fine young black thing you drooled over in eighth grade gym class struts up and down the block looking for one last world to rock. The woman who sat next to you clutching her handbag while you waited for the morning bus and then elbowed you in the solar plexus fighting for a seat plans to call her boss and talk shit until the last minute, then put the receiver to the explosion, saying, I won't be in to work tomorrow. I'll be a fucking evaporated carbon dust ball. You slave, driving, fuck. Last week's issue of Time magazine identified me as the Eben Pied Piper. In US. News and World Report I was the bellwether to ethnic harakiri. History will add my name to the list of maniacal messiahs who sit in hell's homeroom answering the devil's roll call, Jim Jones, David Koresh, whoever led the charge of the Light Brigade, Charles Manson, General Westmoreland, and me. These pages are my memoirs, the battlefield remains of a frightened deserter in the eternal war for civility. Mama Baby, Papa Maybe. 1. Unlike the typical bluesy earthy folksy denim overalls noble in the face of cracker racism a shucks Pulitzer Prize winning protagonist Mojo Magic Black Man, I am not the seventh son of a seventh son of a seventh son. I wish I were, but fate shorted me by six brothers and three uncles. 
the chieftains and queens who sit on top of old Mount Kilimanjaro left me out of the will. They bequeath me nothing, stingy bastards. Cruelly cheating me of my mythological inheritance, my aboriginal superpowers. I never possessed the God-given ability to strike down race-politic evildoers with a tribal chant, the wave of a beaded whammy stick, and a mean glance. Maybe some family fool fucked up and slighted the ancients. Pissed off the gods, too much mumbo in the jumbo perhaps, and so the sons must suffer the sins of the father. My name is Kaufman, Gunnar Kaufman. I'm Black Orestes in the cursed house of Atrus. Preordained by a set of weak-kneed DNA to shuffle in the footsteps of a long cowardly queue of coons, Uncle Toms, and faithful Boogdi Boogdi retainers. I am the number one son of a spineless color-struck son of a bitch who was the third son of an ass, kissing sellout house negro who was indeed a seventh son but only by default. Grandpa Giuseppe Kaufman rolled over his older twin brother Johann in his sleep, smothering him and staking claim to the cherished seventh sonship. From birth my parents indoctrinated me with the idea that the surreal escapades and eyes a common watermelon chicanery of my forefathers was the stuff of hero worship. Their resolute deeds and Uncle Tom exploits were passed down by my mother's dinner table macaroni and cheese oral history lessons. There is nothing worse than a loud griot, and my mother was the loudest. Mom raised my sisters and me as the hard-won spoils of a vicious custody battle that left the porcelain shrapnel of supper dish grenades embedded in my father's neck. The divorce made Mama, Ms. Brenda W. Kaufman, determined to make sure that her children knew their forebears. As a Brooklyn orphan who had never seen her parents or her birth certificate, Mom adopted my father's patriarchal family history for her misbegotten origins. On summer afternoons Nicole, Christina, and I sat at my mother's feet, tracing our bloodlines by running our fingers over the bulging veins that tunneled in her ashy legs. She'd place her hideous pedal extremities on a throw pillow and we would conduct our ancestral investigation while filing down the rock-hard bunions and other dermal crustaceans on her feet. We started with the basics. Danger, kids at work. Nicole, my youngest sister, whom I nicknamed the incredible eternal wailing baby, would open up the questioning in her self-centered style, all the while scraping the mound of dead skin that was my mother's left heel. Ma, am I adopted? No, you are not adopted. I showed you the stretch marks last week. Put some elbow grease into it, goddammit. Pull the skin off with your fingers if you have to, shit. Then Christina, middle child, whom I lovingly rechristened with the Native American appellation fingers in both nostrils thumb in mouth and snot all over the fucking place, would pull on the heartstrings to tighten the filial ties. What about me and Gunnar? No. Can you prove it? Christina would ask, anxious and unconvinced, her heavy breathing blowing mucus bubbles from her nose. Which one's those crinkly lines on your stomach is mine's? Chrissy, if anyone is fool enough to tell you that they your parents, believe them. Okay? Ma. What, Gunnar? Your feet stank. Shut up before I make you fill out that application to military school. The advanced course in Kaufman genealogy didn't start until Mom returned home from earning our livings by testing the unlucky poor for VD at a free clinic in East Los Angeles. I remember she enjoyed bringing the sharp stainless steel tools of her trade and glossy Polaroids of the most advanced cases to the dinner table. Spit shining the speculums and catheters, she'd tell her awful jokes about pricking the pricks and hunting the cunts. I swear somewhere in her unknown past traveling minstrels cakewalked across candlelit theater stages. The seven o'clock suppers were carnival sideshows, featuring mom the amazing crazy lady. She'd wipe our greasy lips, lecturing us about the horrors of sexually transmitted disease while passing mashed potatoes and photos of pussy lesions around the table. For the coup de grace she'd open a prophylactic package, remove and unroll a blue sheath, and stuff the receptacle end into a nostril.
Then she'd sit there lecturing us about the joys of safe sex with a crumpled condom swinging from her nose and bouncing off her chin with each syllable. Suddenly she'd press the open nostril closed with her finger and with a snort snake the unlubricated rubber up her nose. She'd open her mouth and produce a soggy piece of latex, holding it up for all to see with a gloating, ta, da. Let's eat. The festivities continued throughout the meal. Though her designation as world's loudest griot cannot be substantiated, the Guinness Book of World Refords lists her as having the world's loudest swallow. Swallow. Ms. Brenda W. Kaufman, born in 1955, of Los Angeles recorded unamplified swallows at 47 dB, busy street equals 70 dB, jet engine equals 130, while guesting on the David Letterman show drinking New York City tap water on May 3, 1985. On her birthdays I watched the videotape of her performance. A man with an English accent holds a microphone to her throat while she enthusiastically drinks a clear glass of water. In the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is a VU meter with a needle that jumps wildly with every booming swallow. My sisters and I yelled our heads off every time the needle moved into the red zone. When she returned, we proudly took turns placing our fingers on her bobbing Adam's apple as she drank her milk. Between Swallow's mom would ask about our schoolwork and bemoan our miseducations. Slamming down an empty glass of milk, she'd run her tongue over her top lip and bellow, see, there isn't anything a Kaufman can't do. Those history books say anything about your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather on your father's side, Euripides Kaufman? Betcha they don't. Pass the fucking dinner buns and let mama tell you about a colonial negro who would have pulled himself up by the bootstraps had he had boots. The first of a legacy of colored men who forged their own way in the world. Gooner, you listenin'? Uh-huh. What? Yes, ma'am. Mom could tell a motherfucking story. She'd start in with Euripides Kaufman, the youngest slave in history to buy his freedom. I heard the chains shackle to the spirits of Kaufman Negroes past slink and rattle up to the dining room windows. Dead niggers who smacked their arid lips and held their rumbling vacuous stomachs while they stared at the fried chicken, waiting for mom to tell their tales. Too small to smelt and work iron in his master's Boston blacksmith shop, Euripides spent his bondage doing donkey work. After running barefoot errands over the downtown cobblestones, he'd look for ways to fill his idle time. Sitting on the grassy banks of the Charles River, he'd watch the jongler woo money from the pockets of sentimental passers-by. At age seven Euripides saw a means of income. The baby entrepreneur ran home, spread globs of lamp oil over sooty black skin, and parked himself outside the busiest entrance to the Boston Common. Every promenading Bostonian who passed him by answered Euripides's toothy obsequious grin and gleaming complexion with a concerned, Can I help you, son? To which Euripides replied, Would you like to rub me head for good luck? Cost a sixpence. Soon Euripides had a steady clientele of Brahmins and Tories, redcoats, and militiamen paying to pass their palms over his bristly head for luck and a guaranteed afterlife. Six months later he decided to shave his skull to heighten the tactile pleasure, and business boomed. Word quickly got back to his owner and eponym Chauncey Kaufman about the little tar baby's ingenuity in bringing a small measure of fame to his shop. Soon customers came into the shop to have their horses shod and to pat the lil black bastard's head. Customers rode up, tied their horses to the hitching post, and proclaimed, for new shoes, Chauncey. Where's Euripides? Last week I forgot to palm his stubbly skull and the missus caught me buggering the negro lass in the attic. Come, air, you bald-headed good luck charm, you. One mild spring day the nine-year-old Euripides puzzled out how much to charge for a he's so cute grab and twist of the cheek. He looked up to see a black boy about his age auctioned off next to a fruit stand for fifteen pounds. Snookums, on your way back from getting the wig powdered at the coiffeurs, would you please pick up some tomatoes, a head of lettuce, and a little nigger child? 
Ever the shrewd business kid and eager to appraise his own worth, Euripides asked his sweaty coal-faced owner if he was worth 15 pounds on the open market. Master Kaufman assured Euripides that a clever piccaninny such as himself was worth twice that amount. Euripides then reached into his satchel and plunked down 30 pounds in savings from his head, rubbing business on the anvil. Euripides Kaufman walked out of the shop a nine-year-old freeman, never giving a second thought to buying a hat. He went on to become a merchant sailor who attained unheralded fame for being, in Mama's words, the brains behind the Boston Massacre. Familial legend has it that on March 5, 1770, Euripides Kaufman artfully dodged a redcoat's musket shot with his name on it and Crispus Attucks woke up in nigger heaven a martyr. That historic afternoon Euripides and Crispus, his ace boon coon since childhood, sat in a Boston pub drinking drafts of Samuel Adams' pale ale. Oh to be free, black, and twenty-one, drunk on home-brewed hops and the mascot-like acceptance of his fellow white merchant seafarers. The only drawback to Euripides's freedom was that he couldn't charge when the locals rubbed his head with vigorous patronization. Euripides, you dusky halyard, not headed black bloke, how old were you when you started to shed your monkey fur? Maybe you still sleep in it to keep warm at night? Water a few nigger jokes among friends? We Kaufmans have always been the type of niggers who can take a joke. I used to visit my father, the sketch artist at the Wilshire LAPD precinct. His fellow officers would stand around cluttered desks breaking themselves up by telling how many niggers does it take jokes, pounding each other on the back and looking over their broad shoulders to see if me and daddy were laughing. Dad always was. The epaulets on his shoulders raising up like inchworms as he giggled. I never laughed until my father slapped me hard between the shoulder blades. The heavy-handed blow bringing my weight to my tiptoes, raising my chin from my chest, and I'd burp out a couple of titters of self-defilement. Even if I didn't get the joke. What they mean, lick their lips and stick M to the wall. Later I'd watch my father draw composite sketches for victimized citizens who used his face as reference point. He was thick-lipped, nose a tad bigger than yours, with your nostril flare though. Daddy would bring some felon to still life and without looking up from his measured strokes admonish me that my face better not appear on any police officer's sketch pad. He'd send me home in a patrol car, black charcoal smudged all over my face and his patriotic wisdom ringing in my ears, remember, gooner, god, country, and laughter, the world's best medicine. Did your mother get the check? It figures a sellout Kaufman helped jumpstart the American Revolution. Liver-lipped Euripides Kaufman, pint full, whistle and lips wet, deftly redirected the scorn of his colonial rabble-rousing shipmates from him onto a lone adolescent redcoat sentinel stationed in front of the House of Commons just outside the tavern. Hey, blokes! Isn't that lobster-backed scoundrel the Brit Scalawag who cheated the barber Jack Milton out of the coinage for a fair-priced trimming and shave yesterday past? With Euripides and Crispus leading the way, the drunken mob scampered outside for a closer look. Mugs in hand, they surrounded the nervous guard and peppered him with insults. Euripides stood about a yard away from the redcoat, looked him up and down, turned to his mates, and said, Verily, that's the tea and crumpet eating scofflaw. Crispus will support me claim, won't you, big boy? Crispus's eyes, like my father's, like Euripides's, were eager to please, but his mouth was empty of revolutionary dozens. Pining for white America's affection, Crispus Attucks looked toward my great 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 granddad for guidance. Then he parroted Euripides Kaufman's caustic sentiments into the face of the lone attaché of England's new world venture capitalism. I, a cockney chimpanzee with his sparkling flushed pink arse a bit distant from the rest of the pack. Where's your scone-colored missus? Snuggling up to King George, rubbing his pasty paunch and counting our taxes? Squawk. Crispus Attucks wants a cracker. Squawk. How could two nominally free niggers be more libertine? Inciting the colony's wine for independence, black booster engines to the forthcoming rocket's red glare. 
At some point during the famous imbroglio, Euripides, emboldened and bloated with beer, took out his penis and produced a pool of piss in front of the brigade of British reinforcements. Sensing that the armed platoon had reached its saturation point, he shouted, tax this, and smartly marched to the rear of the now uproarious crowd. Leaving an inky, drunken Crispus attucks fronting the overwhelmingly white mob, blathering unintelligible insults to the throne, threatening the entire British Empire with his wooden nigger, beater. Then the now famous volley of shoots and thud of bodies flopping onto the dusty cobblestones. American history found Crispus Attucks dead on a Boston street, but has yet to find Euripides Kaufman's contribution. At the subsequent trial a witness for the prosecution recounted that he heard the soldier who deposited the ball of lead in Crispus's heart regretfully say, Damn, I shot the wrong bloody nigger. Good thing too, because had that British soldier shot the right nigger, my seventh grade class at Manischewitz Junior High would never have gotten to laugh at the ridiculous sons and daughters of the Confederacy's servant class. All fathered by my great to, the seventh power granddad Euripides Kaufman. It was in Ms. Murphy's class that for the first time anyone outside my immediate family heard the tales of the groveling Kaufman male birthright. During Black History Month, to put a class of rootless urchins in touch with our disparate niggerhoods, Ms. Murphy assigned us to make family trees. Although most kids could only go back as far as their grandparents, it was with unabashed pride that we gave oral encapsulations of our caricature American ancestries. No one knew enough to be embarrassed at not knowing our own histories, much less those of any of the posterboard Negro heroes on the walls. I sat midway up the first row of seats in from the door, bored with kids holding up their family trees and giving the same speech, um, the boys are the circles and the girls have the triangle heads. This is me. My six sisters. My brother, he dead. My other brother, he dead too. My mom. My dad. And here go my grandparents. My grandfather was in Vietnam and he crazy. Any questions? Where was my mother born? She was born in Arkansas and she met my father on the Greyhound bus. They fell in love in San Antonio and he touched her in the restrooms in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Then I came. Fuck you, Denise, I wasn't born in no nickel pay toilet. Finally Ms. Murphy called my name. I tucked my family tree under my arm and made my way to the front of the classroom, slapping my boy Jimmy Lopez upside his noggin for good measure. Lifting one hand high above my head, I unfurled my gigantic family tree. It rolled well past my knees and the class owed the generations of crinkled stick nigger couples holding stick hands. I started at the top, with Euripides Kaufman, and went from there. With my mother's hand in my back, her words pouring from my mouth, I stiffly yapped on like a skinny ventriloquist's dummy. I told the class how the Kaufmans migrated south when Swen Kaufman, Euripides's well-traveled grandson, left Boston, unintentionally becoming the only person ever to run away into slavery. Being persona non Anglo-Saxon, Swen was unable to fulfill his uppity dreams of becoming a serious dancer. He was unwelcome in serious dance circles, and the local variety shows couldn't use his Frenchified royal court body syncopations in their Cooney Cooney minstrel productions. Take the crown off your head, Jigabu. Show some teeth, they said. Swen would stoop and bow under any other circumstances, but when it came to dance he refused to compromise. So on a windy night he packed his ballet slippers and stowed away on a merchant ship bound for the cotton belt. Debarking in coastal North Carolina, Swen set out on a sojourn, seeking artistic freedom. He traipsed the tobacco roads, using his New England blue blood diction to put off the curiosities of those concerned with his freeman status. When he ran across lynch mobs, hound dogs, and defenseless parasol toting southern bells, he'd simultaneously gaze at their feet and hold his nose just high enough to suggest a hint of breeding. Answering their inquiries, Swen rolled his R's in polite deference. You ain't from around here, is you, boy? No sir. 
Do the leotards give me away, sir? Mind if we ask you in a few questions? Why no, I fully understand your reasons for rousting me under suspicion of my being a runaway negro. Please resume your interrogation forthwith. You ain't Scottish, is ya, boy? After three days on the road, Swen found himself on the outskirts of a small farming town called Mercy, North Carolina. There he came upon the fields of the Tannenberry Plantation, where some slave hands were turning up rows of tobacco. The rise and fall rhythm of the hoes and pickaxes and the austere urgency of the work songs gave him an idea for a groundbreaking dance opera. A renegade piece that intertwined the stoic movement of forced labor with the casual assuredness of the aristocratic lyric. Entranced with the possibilities, Swen impetuously hopped the wooden fence that separated the slave from the free. Picking up a tool, he smiled at the bewildered nigger next to him and churned feudal earth until sundown, determined to learn the ways of the field slaves. I suppose the niggers warned him, but Swen wouldn't have understood their pigeon drawl. Fool, I don't know who you is, but whoever you is, if you gwine slave in this here tubacky row, you but to stop scattering the top surl in the wind. Cause if de tannenberries don't eat, den you knows the pigs and chickens gwine watch the niggers die. Swen headed back to Moss Tom Tannenberry's sleeping quarters happy with his first day of slavery. He went to bed that night on a stomach full of pig ears and corn leaves, and from every daybreak until his death he woke up an unindentured servant. Initially, upon seeing a free extra hand in the cabins, Moss Tom Tannenberry smiled at his good fortune, recalling poorer days when family members outnumbered the slaves. A precocious Confederate tyke, he'd pulled on Grandma Verona's billowing yellow whalebone dress, pleading and pouting for a nigger of his own. Moss Tom recalled the spittle and scorn in her voice when she replied with something about darkies not growing on trees. In the chill of a just-breaking morning, Swen Kaufman danced to work. Giddily in rehearsal for his magnum opus, his lanky frame spun, jump, ball, change, in the lifting dark North Carolinian mist. The slaves hated him. Moss Tom grew to hate him. Swen returned from the fields happier than he'd ever been in Boston. He considered himself dancer in residence at the Tannenberry Plantation, free room and board and plenty of rehearsal space. Come sundown the dirty energetic primo cotton picker pranced home, back straight, chin up, a Yankee clipper lost at sea, pointing his toes in the wind. Moss Tom decided Swen's cultured Boston manners and skipped to my Lou Verve were bad for morale. Worse yet was the fascination in Mrs. Courtney Tannenberry's lit-up cheeky countenance as she sat around listening to Swen's stories of his carefree European escapades as a fashionable valet noir for a French choreographer. Raised in northern Virginia, Mrs. Tannenberry considered herself a balletomane and aficionado of high art. She'd sit under the big house portico fanning herself and aching for culture not based on agrarian harvest cycles. Swen was eager to play raconteur. Excused by the missus from fieldwork, he'd fill her swooning head with stories of dining in seaport bistros in Marseilles and witnessing the exquisite nascence of modern dance at the Paris Opera, the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen, and London's renowned King Theatre. They discussed Swen's theories on how the rigid daring obstinate Russian psyche would push ballet to the heights of expressionistic art. Punctuating his points with leaps and sachets around the gazebo, Swen conducted ironic lectures on how the tradition of European patrician gloating and African tribal rituals influenced the southern cotillions. In wishful reenactments of performances staged hundreds of times in his head, he'd spin and lift Mrs. Tannenberry's toddling daughters to the clouds. Moss Tom wasn't having it and demanded that Swen leave the grounds. Swen refused. How could he leave midway through choreographing a hand dance based on the dexterity needed to remove cotton balls cleanly from the stem and the intricacies of the missus's crocheting techniques? Didn't a whole lot of niggers get whipped on Tom Tannenberry's plantation, but Moss Tom whipped Swen Kaufman. Demi-ply, five lashes. Second position, ten lashes. Pirouette over the cotton seedlings, fifteen lashes, 
rock salt and scotch in the wounds. A performance of Swen's Dance of the Discreet Glance behind the stables merited a beating that started the dogs barking and kept slaves and masters up through the night listening to Swen's skin sizzle. Eventually the slaves came to admire Swen's persistence and to appreciate his art, but not before Tom Tannenberry beat the classic romanticism out of Swen's feet and slapped the worldly effluvium from his mouth. Crumpled and broken on the ground, lips painted with blood, face powdered with red clay dust, Swen was told he could nigger jig to his heart's content. He healed and did, soon falling in love with his favorite partner, Clocinda Didion. Swen and Clocinda's wedding was his final performance. Under the guise of rehearsing an elaborate wedding ceremony, he used every slave on the plantation in a glorious swirling production. On the wedding day they danced. To the accompaniment of body drums and fiddles, maids of honor, bridegroom, and guests swooped across the fields. They tightroped the tops of fences many had never even dared look at, much less touch. For most it was the first time they'd been within twenty yards of the fences. The audience consisted of the pregnant Mrs. Tannenberry and her four daughters, trailing the action as it traversed the grounds, applauding at the appropriate intervals. In the middle of the ceremony the Tannenberry women held the broom, cheering as the happy helot couple jumped over it, kissing in midair, landing in matrimony. In the last movement the adults passed unlit torches to the children, then lay in the slaves' graveyard next to the mounds of earth and rotted tombstones. The children peered into the windows of the big house, the still unlit torches resting on their bony shoulders. Then they too went to the graveyard and lay down next to their parents. Mrs. Tannenberry cried for a month afterward and on every anniversary of Clocinda and Swen's regal wedding visited the graveyard. All this before recess. Over coffee cake and chocolate milk, kids who normally spent the respite from math teasing me about the length of my pants and placing bets on which of two shirts I would wear tomorrow begged me to continue my story. What happened next? Why didn't they light the torches? How much is a sixpence in American money? Did Euripides Kaufman know George Washington? What happened next, motherfucker? The bell rang and they rushed back to the classroom to find Ms. Murphy sitting on the edge of her desk. The students sat in little plastic orange chairs and leaned over the tabletops. All ears and big eyes. I continued my presentation, swelling with a strange pride. Swen and Clocinda Kaufman begot some astoundingly servile niggers. One of whom, Franz von Kaufman, was exceedingly bootlicking even for a slave. Franz von Kaufman was born looking like the quintessential Matthew Brady 1857 nigger daguerreotype. Though fresh out of Clocinda's womb, Franz von's glossy dark black skin was fissured by creased and starched wrinkles. A shock of wispy gray hair capped a sunken face tight lips, and sullen yellow watery suffering eyes. Everyone called him Old Franz Vaughn. Mrs. Tannenberry delivered Compton Benjamin Quinton, the Tannenberry's youngest and only male child, within days of Franz Vaughn. The two boys shared the same crib and nipples. Even in infancy Franz Vaughn's subservience was evident. If baby Moss Compton wanted the nipple Franz Vaughn suckled, He'd nudge Franz Vaughn, whine, and drool in his ear, and Franz Vaughn would move without complaint. No whining, no whimpering. Clocinda soon figured out that the little Tannenberry devil was born greedy and nearly blind. The stubborn Compton fancied himself a brave explorer and refused to let his poor sight handicap him. One nose-to-nose -nose close up look at his dusky running buddy old Franz Vaughn and young Moss Compton knew intuitively that to realize his lofty goals, he'd need a loyal manservant. He asked his father that Franz Vaughn be given to him, and Tom Tannenberry, remembering his longing for a nigger of his own, quickly agreed. While Franz Vaughn was still a pup, Moss Tom handed his leash over to Compton Tannenberry. Remember, son, you promised to take care of it. In years to come old Franz Vaughn served as Compton's seeing-eye dog, constant companion, and best friend. Franz Vaughn and Compton could be found playing Inquisition in the Walnut Groves. 
This game was a degenerate version of hide and seek where Franz Vaughn would roll in a honeysuckle patch and then play the heathen. Bathed in young Moss Compton's favorite smell, Franz Vaughn would hide among the walnut trees, awaiting discovery and salvation. The sightless erstwhile Torquemada would seek Franz Vaughn out, nose open for the unique scent of honeysuckle and unwashed infidel. His ears honing in on Franz Vaughn's faux heretic war cries and blasphemes. The creeks burble and gurgle, the rustle in the leaves, are the boogers, sniffles, and breeze of the sneezing gods of Dixie. Compton would find Franz Vaughn, tie him to a tree, trade his spit for Franz Vaughn's land and soul, pelt him with walnuts, and convert the swarthy pagan by reciting biblical verse. Time aged Moss Compton more than it did Franz Vaughn. At twenty-five old Franz Vaughn remained a taller version of the tame negro he'd always been, only the wrinkles circling his eyes and lips had deepened. He hadn't grown wiser, more worldly, or even bitter about his servitude. Newfangled ideas confused him. Franz Vaughn the young adult didn't understand the nigger talk about abolition, or the white folk's pride in their metal gunboats. Those braille books Moss Compton got with increasing frequency in the mail frightened him. How could he read Moss Compton the poems of Ovid and Homer if the great myths were transformed to raised dots? Can't teach an old nigger new tricks, the Tannenberries teased him. Old Franz Vaughn laughed at their perceptiveness and stayed by Compton's side, safely leading him past the few pitfalls faced by a spoiled southern aristocrat. Compton Tannenberry slipped just as easily into his destined adulthood. The denizens of mercy marveled at the contrast of his princely smooth upright blind gait to Franz Vaughn's sighted slumped over shuffle. In Compton's presence the white folks could often be heard saying how he'd aged gracefully, gone from barley malt to fine scotch whiskey. When Moss Compton wasn't around, the niggers who toiled under the sun and his confederate shogunate would say that Moss Compton hadn't aged but curdled like stagnant milk. His white arrogance had piled and thickened, casting its sour odor wherever he went. Sundays were for church and cards. In the afternoon Franz Vaughn sat in an unvarnished pew in the farthest corner of the Anglican-Saxon Triple Baptist Church. From there he watched the good Reverend William Dern deliver sermons that alternated between damnation and salvation. Compton Tannenberry allowed no one but Franz Vaughn to shepherd him down the aisle to partake in the communion. He held Franz Vaughn tightly at the elbow while receiving the vintage spirit and the cracker body of Christ. Nights were spent in the sacrosanct parlors of the Mercy Socialite Club for genteel gentlemen. During the high-stakes poker games Franz Vaughn sat at Compton's side, placing Compton's bets for him, tapping out their secret code on Compton's arm to let him know the cards in his hand. Compton quickly calculated his odds, and Franz Vaughn humbly reeled in the winnings from the astonished stately Tar Heel gentry. Once safely away from the gaming tables, Franz Vaughn and Compton would tell their running joke that they had the advantage because no one could read a blind man's eyes and no one could read a nigger's mind. When the Civil War broke out, Compton enthusiastically went to enlist, knowing that he'd be turned away but hoping to serve the South in some capacity. As expected, the draft board told Compton he was unfit for combat, though his breeding, poker face, and guile could be used in other ways. The Confederacy asked him to be the chief negotiator in the top-secret trading of surplus bales of southern cotton for the Union opium the rebels desperately needed to treat their wounded. This job required Compton to take a train from Durham to Washington, D.C., every two weeks to meet with the penny-pinching Yankees. The catch was that Franz Vaughn couldn't accompany his master on these missions, since a crafty Nigra, even one as outwardly dutiful as Franz Vaughn, would be an unnecessary breach of security. Franz Vaughn spent the first two years of his war fighting separation anxiety and faithfully awaiting the 6.15 p.m. arrival of the Hootenanny Choo Choo from Washington, D.C. Franz Vaughn was never happier than serving as his friend's footstool into the carriage that carried them back to the Tannenberry Plantation. Sunday, March 27, 1864 
The 615 pulled in and Moss Compton Tannenberry's cane never made its exploratory pokes from the first-class car. Compton's whiny yell of, where's my nigger, failed to travel down the length of the platform. Franz Vaughn waited for hours, then drove the empty buggy back to the plantation. Why won't the Tannenberries look him in the eye when he tells them Moss Tom wasn't on the train? Franz Vaughn returns to the station at 6.15 the next night and every night for the rest of his life, looking every passenger that gets off the train dead in the face. No one ever had the nerve to tell Franz Vaughn that his comrade and owner died when he accidentally swallowed a piece of opium he was transporting, mistaking it for one of the sugar cubes he brought back for old Franz Vaughn and the unrequisitioned horses. I wish that my shameful history had stopped with pitiful Franz Vaughn, that I could say that after years of obedience my forefathers embraced the twentieth century's waves of black pride. The seventh graders ate quiet lunches in the school cafeteria. I told the story of Wolfgang Kaufman to the rustle of brown paper bags and the muffled crunches of mouthfuls of potato chips. Wolfgang Kaufman was my great-great-uncle who once held the highest appointed municipal position a Negro in Nashville, Tennessee, could aspire to in the 1920s, chief of the Department of Visual Segregation. With Jim Crow as his muse, he spent muggy afternoons under a splotchy painter's cap, painting and hanging the for whites only and for colored only signs that hung over quasi-public places throughout Nashville. At $5 an hour, not many Nashville blacks were doing much better, and Wolfgang took pride in his stenciled artistry. A fit of absent-mindedness caused him to lose the precious contract and he was spotted exiting from the men's room after taking a satisfying early morning number two in the whites-only toilet. The sight of a dark black man zipping up his fly and pulling underwear from the crack of his ass was too much for any virtuous white woman, especially the one passed out in horror at his feet. Ms. O'Dwyer came to with Wolfgang hovering over her face, apologetically jabbering something about there being no toilet paper in the colored washroom. Quickly regaining her faculties and privileged sensibilities, Ms. O'Dwyer slapped Wolfgang across his pleading lips and reported him to the mayor's office. Some benevolent civic official commuted his lynching, and soon after the nigger moved to Chicago and was polishing floors at WGN Radio with a huge, thank ya, laud, smile on his face. One sunny Tuesday morning a tacky fat and skinny twosome barreled into the station to rehearse scenarios for a new radio show. Wolfgang briefly stopped squeegeeing the soundstage windows to listen to the duo, Freeman F., Gosden and Charles J., Correll run through their stale repertoire. Funny thing happened to me on the way to the station today. Along with the station managers, Wolfgang groaned and covered his ears, remembering hearing their baritone voices when he was hightailing through New Orleans. They were good mimics, but their material was awful. Wolfgang decided to help the boys out. During a break in rehearsal, he popped his derby-topped head into the studio, removed the stubby cigar from his mouth, and suggested to the worried, looking Gosden and Correll that they join him for lunch. Y'all gonna hear some real comedic genius. Having nothing to lose, the white boys followed Wolfgang to the Chicago Circle Cab Company, where a group of cabbies on their lunch break sat inside the dispatch booth talking about each other's shortcomings and women and telling hilarious, if only slightly exaggerated, stories of black life in a big city. The bashful Peckerwood sat dumbfounded on the fender of a broken-down cab. Neither man had ever contemplated the existence of a black society beyond elevator operators and occasional snapshots of well-to-do Negroes in the Sun Times. Here were men talking in a myriad of dialects about a vivacious life which to most of America was invisible. The butt of most of the jokes was an understated college-educated cab driver named Enos. The loudest and most rambunctious of the Negro storytellers was a plump unemployed dandy named Sandy. Wolfgang smiled as the similarities in physique and personality dawned on the struggling radio personalities. Wolfgang stood up and sang a slow rendition of Carry Me Back to Old Virginie, and Gosden and Correll raced back to the station, their heads buzzing with ideas for a weekly show called Amos and Andy. 
Soulless white American radio was destined for droll hours of Fibber McGee and Molly till Wolfgang Kaufman shucked and jived to its rescue. America got a pair of stumbling jitterbugging icons, Wolfgang Kaufman got a ten cent raise. Ms. Murphy's seventh grade history class, still in rapt attention, unanimously voted to skip watching eyes on the prize so they could hear the tale of Ludwig Kaufman. Son of Wolfgang, Cousin Ludwig used his father's tenuous mop bucket industry connections to become a manager of white acts that ripped off the Motown rhythm and blues hysteria. Some of his more popular acts were Gladys White and the Waitress Tips and the Stevedores, whose melodic hit, Three Times a Longshoreman, made a little noise on the eastern seaboard. Ludwig was proudest of his project The Four Cops, a Los Angeles-based quartet who charted with a ballad entitled Reach Out and I'll Be There Hitting You Upside the Head with a Nightstick. Lost in Chicago's South Side, the dapper Ludwig Kaufman stumbled into Mosque 27 looking for directions to a club that had booked his sequined law enforcement officers. Playing the rear in a metal folding chair, Uncle Kaufman was fascinated with the temple's rhythmical rhetoric and style, and the potential in a group called the Blonde Mohammedets intrigued him. He quickly asked how he could join and where he could get some of those bow ties and shiny shoes. Knowing a mark when they saw one, the black Muslims and the FBI trained Ludwig to be the Judas to black nationalism's Jesus. It was cousin Ludwig who on February 21, 1965, stood up in the middle of the Audubon ballroom moments before Malcolm X was to give his last speech and shouted, Hey man! Get your hands out of my pocket! Eight months later the police found him in Tin Pan Alley, dead and sans shiny shoes. After school I held court near the kickball diamond, leaning against the metal backstop, rambling on about my cousin Salveig Kaufman. Newsweek magazine assigned cousin Salveig to report on the press conference announcing the results of the reinvestigation of Martin Luther King's assassination. The panel opened up the questioning by choosing an affirmative action baby who'd benefited from King's movement. On national television Salveig repaid the civil rights movement. He stood up, pen and pad in hand, and said, never mind James Earl Ray in FBI intervention, inquiring minds want to know who's fucking Coretta Scott King? The aging eternal widow's next public appearance was her funeral four months later. Some say natural causes, some say suicide, some death by public embarrassment. These schoolyard chronicles never included my father's misdeeds. I could distance myself from the fuck-ups of the previous generations, but his weakness shadowed my shame from son to son. His history was my history. A reprobate ancestry that snuggled up to me and tucked me in at night. In the morning it kissed me on the back of the neck, plopped its dick in my hands, and asked me to blow reveille. Front and center, nigger. The racist campestral doctrine of Yeehaw, Mississippi, raised Mr. Rolf Kaufman, a.k.a. Daddy. Instead of pumping property taxes into neighborhood schools, the town stuck its tongue out at Brown v. Board of E.D.U. Fashion and satisfied the Supreme Court's integrationist stipulations by bussing the dark-skinned niggers and the light-skinned niggers to Dred Scott High. Living in the only black household within walking distance of exclusively white and predominantly redneck Jefferson Davis High, my father didn't even know about the colored bus. He showed up for the first day of high school dressed in cuffed levis, a flannel shirt, a Daniel Boone coonskin hat, and a Captain Midnight decoder ring. He was such a docile and meek non-threat that the principal let him register for classes. My father fondly recalled the laughs and cold celebratory summer vacation Dixie beers he shared with the good old boy senior class after their macabre reenactment of the Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney murders. Rolf played Cheney, two Down syndrome kids from the special ed class reprised the roles of the hapless miscreant Jews, and three carloads of football players acted as the vigilante sheriffs. My father and the two Jewish boys drove down Route 17 toward Meridian with the Erzatz peace officers right behind them. After a few miles of horn blaring, bumper to bumper tailgating, and beer cans sounding off the windows like tin hailstones, Yeehaw's phony finest grew bored and forced my father's car to a stop. 
My father smiled weakly as the starting quarterback, Plessy, go deep, Ferguson, purposefully approached the driver's side. The strong-armed wishbone navigator par excellence opened the door with his scholarship hands and asked my father, what are you SNC searing about? Get it, fellas? SNCC, snickering? The rest of the team burst out in laughter and proceeded to pull the scared, student activists out of the car, taking turns cuffing my dad and the retarded kids about the face, swinging them by the ankles into the muddy bog that ran alongside the highway. Later that night all the players in the living theater met in the glade behind the courthouse for a few rap party beers. A campfire's glowing flames lit up a keg placed next to a thick-trunk southern pine known as a swing-low tree. Shadows of the strong-limbed branches flickered across soused contemplative faces. My father drank so much he passed out. He came to naked, his entire body spray-painted white, his face drool-glued against the trunk of the swing, low tree. He ran home under the sinking Mississippi moon, his white skin tingling with assimilation. Three hours after graduating from high school in 1968, Dad joined the Army. He served two tours in Vietnam. His commanding officer, elated with my father's patriotism, placed him in charge of a crazy black is beautiful platoon of citified troublemakers. He led them on search and destroy missions through the sharpened thickets, eyes out for snipers, listening to his men gripe about the precipitation, the white man this and the white man that. After he joined the Los Angeles Police Department, he'd complain that he'd left the Indonesian jungle for the Isna Cohesion jungle, gone from fighting Viet Song to King Kong. I remember one day he came home drunk from the LAPD's unofficial legal defense fundraiser for officers accused of brutality. Dad later told me they showed Birth of a Nation followed by two straight hours of What's Riot highlights. He sat me on his lap and slurred war stories. How his all-black platoon used to ditch him in the middle of patrols, leaving him alone in some rice paddy having to face the entire communist threat by his lonesome. Once he stumbled on his men behind the DMZ, cooling with the enemy. The sight of the slant-eyed niggers and nigger niggers sharing K-rations and rice, enjoying a crackling fire and the quiet Southeast Asian night, flipped Pops the fuck out. He berated his rebellious troops, shouting, Ain't this a bitch, the gorillas snacking with the gorillas. Hello. Don't you fucking baboons know that this is the goddamn enemy? The fucking yellow peril and you fucking Benedict Leroy Robinson Jefferson Arnolds are traitors to the democracy that weaned you apes from primitivism. You know, you're probably eating dog. The VC saw the disconcerted looks on the faces of the black American men, and a good colored boy from Detroit raised his rifle and put an M-16 slug inches from my pop's crotch. My father's men just sat there waiting for him to bleed to death. The Vietnamese had to beg them to take my dad back to the base. My father ended this confessional with the non sequitur wisdom that ended all our conversations, son, don't ever mess with no white women. To my knowledge no male Kaufman had ever slept with a white woman, not out of lack of jungle hunger or for preservation of racial purity but out of fear. I'd watch my dad talk to white women, drowning them with, yes, ma'ams, his darting eyes looking just past their ears. If the first lady were to walk past my father naked with the original constitution taped to her back like a, kick me, sign, my dad wouldn't even crane his neck. The last thing he'd want to see was some flabby butt and a hooded mob chasing him back to nigger town. On our custody outings to the drag races in Pomona, my father would tell me how he came back from the war and met my mother at a stock car race. They fell immediately in love, the only two black folks in the world who knew the past five winners of the Daytona 500 and would recognize Big Daddy Don Garlitz in the street. Then he'd put his arm around me and say, don't you think black women are exotic? Kaufman lore plays out like an autogamous self-pollinating men's club. There are no comely Kaufman superwomen. No poetic heroines caped in kinte cloth stretching welfare checks from here to the moon. No noble black women who could set a wayward negro straight with a snap of the head and a stinging, nigger, poolies. 
the women who allied themselves to the Kaufman legacy are invisible. Their existence and contributions cut off like the Sphinx's broad nose, subsumed by the mystic of an astronomical impotency. Every once in a while a woman's name tangentially floated from my mother's lips as a footnote to some fool's parable, only to dissipate with the vegetable steam. Aunt Joni's mean banana daiquiri. Meredith's game-winning touchdown run versus Madam C. J. Walker High. Giuseppe's second wife Amy's Perry Como record collection. Cousin Madge, who was the complexion of pound cake dipped in milk. These historical cameos were always followed by my mother's teeth-sucking disclaimers, but that's not important, or, let's not go there. I wondered, where did my male predecessors find black women with names like Joni, Meredith, and Amy? Who were these women? Were they weaker than their men, or were they proverbial black family lynchpins? I spent hours thumbing through photo albums, fearful that I was destined to marry a black Mormon Brigham Young University graduate named Mary Jo and become the spokesperson for the Coors Brewing Company. They say the fruit never falls far from the tree, but I've tried to roll down the hill at least a little bit.